Okay, welcome back. I uh, hope you're getting some value from this series of uh, short videos on financial economics. In this third video in our little cluster, we're going to take a look at the ideas of a very famous economist who studied the financial sector years ago, but has come back to prominence in recent times. And his name is Hyman Minsky. So Minsky, pictured here, created uh, something called the financial instability hypothesis. And his life's work was to understand better, more deeply, the causes of financial instability in capitalist countries. His research has certainly come into prominence again when the global financial crisis kicked in 10 years ago. His argument is that when you have a period of prolonged prosperity, when things are going really well, and people are very optimistic about the future, what tends to happen is that financial institutions such as banks start investing in even riskier assets in search of higher returns. So the economic system becomes more vulnerable uh, and eventually uh, defaults and, and risks start to take over. The Minsky moment is when a, a situation is reached where debt levels reach breaking point and asset prices such as stocks and shares and property starts plunging. So when bad news happens, the financial system risks being too highly leveraged. People have borrowed too much money to make their investments and there is a risk of systemic collapse as the value of assets start falling and the real economy starts going into reverse. So the Minsky hypothesis, in a nutshell, is that capitalist financial systems are inherently unstable. Really important phrase for your notes, inherently unstable. And that instability comes from periods of stability, periods of relative macroeconomic tranquility. Let's work through this. Consider an economy which is in a phase of strong growth, doing pretty well. Growth is strong, unemployment is falling, but it takes into that period debts from previous cycles. So the strong growth phase, the strong period of economic growth, increases the profits of the commercial banks. People, are, More people in work, they're earning extra incomes, the, the, the circular flow is doing well, and that makes the debt appear more serviceable for people. Perhaps they want to take out a new loan on a new car <clears throat> or perhaps increase their mortgage to pay for a home extension. Typically, in the tranquil period, the commercial banks relax the lending criteria, which were considered prudent in the past. So perhaps they're more willing to lend out a bigger percentage of people's incomes, for example. So in the period of tranquility, with growth and employment and incomes rising, the banking system lends more money out supply of credit increases and that increases the leverage of the banking system the ratio of loans to assets that credit boom drives growth drives asset prices property prices rising share prices doing well but the debt to gdp ratio increases and that lifts the risk for the whole economy if there's some kind of external shock according to the minsky theory just a small increase in bad debt, debts and loans that can't be repaid, can then make the financial system unstable. And I think if you've seen the film The Big Short, great film, you'll know at the moment in the film where that, that becomes apparent to those people who are shorting the market. Crucial to the Minsky hypothesis to, is to understand uh, the upswing and the downswing of asset price cycles. So when we're in a situation where, for example, property prices are doing really well, house prices are going up, people have the expectation that those prices will continue to rise. So that increases the demand for credit, particularly at a time when banks are perhaps more willing to lend. So the expansion of the supply of credit leads to increased asset prices. That increases bank profits and confidence. They then relax their credit risks and therefore they increase the supply of credit still further. In other words, when the asset price cycle is on the upswing, the financial institutions are willing and able to lend out more. And if you like, that adds fuel to the fire. The big danger of the upswing, you get a big oversupply of credit and over demand for assets, which drives prices beyond their fundamental value. However, <clears throat> the downswing, when asset prices start to fall, perhaps when property prices have peaked, lenders tighten up their lending criteria. The supply of loans contracts, 
oftentimes lenders stop lending to each other. We get what's called a credit crunch. So the financial markets basically stop lending to each other. And crucially, a rise in bad debts and loan defaults has a direct effect on the profits of, of commercial banks. It means they're starting to eat into their capital reserves. A rise in non-performing loans means that banks have bad debts, their reserves are falling, therefore they're not going to lend out as much. And of course that amplifies the fall in the price of property and shares. So in the downswing, the big danger is bankruptcy, default, and the, the legacy of debt overhang. And of course in a, in a major crisis, banks can fail because of insolvency and also because they run out of cash, particularly when savers, depositors decide they want their money back. Now, typically, commercial banks try to make a profit. How do banks make a profit? They make a profit because they charge a higher rate of interest on loans than the interest rate they pay to savers. That's called the interest rate spread. They make a, a charge, they charge a fee when they're arranging a loan or an overdraft or a mortgage. And also they, they are brokers. The many banks provide currency and share dealing services and they charge a brokerage fee for doing so. These are the ways in which commercial banks can make money and during the boom times, serious money. But we know from studying financial instability that banks can fail as well. So how do banks fail? Because of runs on the bank. This is when depositors, people who put their savings in the bank, start to panic and start to withdraw their money. And banks often have a very low ratio of cash to deposits. They may not have enough money to pay all the depositors who, who are queuing up outside. So that can create a liquidity crisis. Banks fail because of a credit crunch. Banks stop lending to each other so that they're unable to borrow money from other banks even, even overnight. And they fail because the losses on their loans and their bad debts can become just too heavy to bear. So loan defaults and bad debts go up, losses accelerate, and as a result, the capital reserves of the banks collapse. Banks' credit rating declines, their share price falls, and there can be a significant risk that the bank could collapse unless there's some form of bailout from the, from the government. So the financial system has within it, inherently within it, the potential to be unstable, non-resilient, particularly, according to the Minsky hypothesis, particularly when we've had a period of tranquility, and the lenders, the banks, think that this time somehow it's different and they can, they can they may take ever riskier loans and things to try and increase their profits. The lesson of the Minsky theory is that capital systems tend to be unstable. The pursuit of profit and the, uh, the unwillingness to recognise that, that things have, have changed could often be the seed of, of downfall for commercial banks. This will lead us into the fourth video where we look at how banks are being regulated in the UK at the moment and in particular the need for banks to be sufficiently capitalised to be able to withstand a major economic shock.